The Super Mario Bros. movie is an astronomical success by every metric that matters, and people across fandoms are taking notice, and rightfully so, it's a great movie in my opinion. A trend I've seen though is people from pundit to fan, be it in the media or just on social media alike, suggesting that this success is owed to Mario being some sort of iconic anomaly. I think it's simultaneously more complex, yet much more simple than that. Let's talk about it. First of all, make no mistake, Mario is a Mickey Mouse level entertainment icon. That character and IP at large is and has been a household name for millions upon millions of people across the world for nearly half a century. And that relevance and adoration is only going up as time goes on. It's also important to note that unlike Mickey Mouse, this relevance has almost entirely been accrued from a single medium. Even Pokemon owes its position in pop culture to being a transmedia property essentially from the moment it left Japan. While the Super Mario brand has dipped its toes in a few projects in different verticals, never until now did it do so at the level of care and creator-led involvement that Pokemon has all along. Obviously, the Mario Bros. Super Show existed. You'd be hard pressed to argue that was on the same level or even in the same universe as the Pokemon anime though. The same can be said about the 1993 live action Super Mario Bros. movie when compared to Pokemon the movie Mewtwo Strikes Back. And that's because these attempts relied entirely on the same anecdote people are attributing the success of the 2023 animated Mario movie of the same name to. It's Mario, of course it will sell. There's a few problems with this, some of which speak to the undervalued depth of why Mario matters and has mattered to people, and others are kind of the antithesis of that. Let's start with talking Mario up, as if the internet hasn't been doing that enough as it is these past few weeks. Mario is known by many as the king of video games, and that's because these games, the series, and every sub-series it spawned cater to fans of quite literally all ages like no other. And this is one angle that is being woefully misrepresented in the discourse. Mario isn't a video game icon. He is an icon, full stop. He just so happens to come from the world of video games. And this distinction may make people feel one way or another, be it how dare you, well duh, or even what's the difference? And I think that divide is why this bears mentioning or for some, repeating. I also bring this up to say, and segue into the next point, video games don't need to be led by an icon on the level of Mario to be successful. And I'd even go as far as to say studios could stand to fall several rungs down the ladder to find excellent candidates to turn into successful film adaptations. Hell, I'd argue several of them can even be billion dollar box office darlings as well. To do this, let's look at the top 50 grossing films of all time. And before anyone pedantically brings up inflation, this video is intending to discuss what is currently working in the film industry. Had it been released this year, Gone with the Wind wouldn't have sold in 2023 like it did in 1939. I think we all have the deductive reasoning skills necessary to understand, or should anyway. Off rip, you'll notice there's some themes going on here, some more obvious than others. Less obvious than that, I'm sure, I'd say they all actually boil down to the same thing. Let's break that down a bit. Okay, so the most overwhelmingly covered to death and back trend you'll see here is superhero movies. And so as not to bury the lead too far into the video, this is the catalyst for why I believe so strongly that video game movies can continue to climb. And furthermore, why I feel they don't have to start and end at Mario. Because one, they had very similar trajectories in their path to getting the whole film adaptation situation figured out. There were countless examples of half-assed attempts at cashing in on these franchises' fandoms. Eventually, one got it kind of right, then another one, then another, and so on. Two, the video game industry actually grosses a lot more money than the film industry as it stands. It's not hard or unreasonable to conclude that if people will spend $60 or more on a video game property in video game form, at least those people would spend a fourth of that or often less on that property in other mediums. This was true for comics and they for the most part didn't have the breadth of already casually invested fans that the video game industry does. These are the people that make 
billion dollar movies. Obviously, people like us that care to watch or even make videos like this one, for instance, subscribe if you're enjoying it, by the way, help get the word out and may even see it multiple times with multiple groups of people, as I'm sure was and remains true for comic book movies. Ultimately, though, we are outnumbered by the people that play games and you may never even know because it's a very small piece to the puzzle that is how they spend their free time. Three, while I will push back on the common claim that nerd culture is now pop culture, since I don't believe it will ever be the default to delve into anything in the same way that nerds do, as I just touched on, I do, however, firmly believe that many things that originated from and are embraced within nerd culture definitely are. It's with that in mind that I think this becomes pertinent once you take more than a passing glance at the list below the top 10. Every film, with the exception of four, sort of, that we'll get to, on this list was a previously established intellectual property before it made its way to theaters and immediately after box office dominance. And there's no real rhyme or reason on how they become that. Some were books, some were offshoots of less financially successful films, some were theme park rides. You see where I'm going with this? There's nothing about video games that says their franchises are any different in this regard. As for those exceptions, all of them benefit from what is effectively the same thing as being an established IP, coming from an established creator. James Cameron accounts for two of the exceptions, being Titanic, which is like, I guess it's based on a real world event, so you can argue it was established in that regard, but meh, semantics. And the other, an extension of the former in the sense that Cameron has accrued fame and acclaim for creating Titanic, Avatar. The sequel is also on the list, but like it's a sequel, so that falls firmly into established IP territory. The third and fourth exceptions on the list, I think we can all agree on. Zootopia and Frozen, it's Disney. Box office dominance is kind of their thing. This brings me back to my original point and a point that I've tried to hammer home for years now. Nintendo is literally the only corporation on planet Earth with the intellectual property to compete with Disney in terms of recognizability, brand loyalty, and creative scrutiny when it comes to that brand. It's not just Mario. Pokemon can do it even bigger than Detective Pikachu provided they laser into what the masses associate with that brand. The Legend of Zelda can do it too. You may say people don't know Zelda, who yes, I know is the boy, but they didn't know Elsa either. Also, I maintain that it's ultimately unimportant, but I call cap. 30 million people purchased The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. People know what Zelda is in the year of our lore 2023. Animal Crossing could do it. It's hard to argue the general public doesn't know that franchise. Even if they couldn't name Bob the Cat, Isabel, or even Tom Nook, they would definitely be able to identify them with that brand. I'd go as far to say any long-standing Smash Brothers character could helm a movie in the same way Iron Man, who at the time of the release of his 2008 film was at best a D-tier hero, is now the lead of 30% of the top 10 grossing films of all time. All of that to say, while yes, the IP being well known and well liked is important to success in entertainment, the most important thing in entertainment is a compelling product. After all, while Iron Man started all of the success of the MCU, only one of the actual Iron Man movies cracked that top 50 list, and there's even two non-Avengers movies above it on the list. One of those aforementioned films is Spider-Man, which is essentially the Mario of superheroes, so there's that, but the other one is Black Panther, another hero that prior to its foray into film was virtually unknown by the general public. This tells me that while a franchise on the level of Mario can and will serve certainly hold its own, there can and will be contenders for that same or even greater success. With that said, not to pull the wool over your eyes or anything like that, I don't even buy the idea that you need to be a Disney or Nintendo in terms of relevance to see similar success. But properties and or brands do need to be a Disney or Nintendo in the sense that they understand what makes their IP compelling and are making films like it. The original Super Mario Bros. movie didn't work because the movie studio that Nintendo shrugged and gave the rights to make the film believed the Mario name alone would be enough to sell the film, and didn't do much more than just that with the opportunity, slapped the name on a largely disconnected product and ran off with whatever profits they could. The 2023 Mario Bros. movie, on the other hand, works because it understands that it needs to maintain the reason why that name has any weight at all. There's a reason why we all have played 
played these games for this long, there's a reason why they have found mainstream success in their own right, and that reason has been, can be, and will continue to be translated to not only just the medium of film, but whatever medium creative people that care to make it so see fit. Everyone at every part of the chain needs to recognize what the marketing team behind the original Pokemania boom intimately understood. We're all people. Relatability is innate and irresistible and those people clearly knew that and used it to their advantage. They didn't talk about Pokemon like it was some crazy thing that only nerds will like. They talked about it like it was the coolest thing that kids just like me or you at the time were already in love with. That's where gaming at large is now. The studios that understand that are the ones that will emulate elevate and exponentiate that success. If you want to support this channel, check out our Patreon to see if any of the available tiers are a good fit for you. If you want to hang out with the community, our free to join Discord server is linked in the description alongside that and our social media accounts. Above all, subscribe to Redirect and ring the bell to be notified when new videos go live. Okay, that's it for me. See you in the next video.